to our next speaker, who is Ellie Quinn, a genetics counsellor here at Royal Brompton Hospital. And she's going to uh, cover the role of genetic testing. So I will hand over to you, Ellie. Thank you. Hi everyone. Yes, so I'm working as a genetic counsellor at the Brompton Hospital, mainly seeing in um, patients with inherited heart disease, but also um, patients with respiratory conditions as well. Um, let me just share my slides. Go. Oops. Okay. Can you see those? Okay. Yes, nice and clear, thanks. Perfect. Um, so yes, I thought um, today we could just kind of cover some of the big questions. So the things that I tend to get asked when I'm meeting a patient for a genetic counselling appointment, just to give you a bit of background on um, sort of the process and the things that you might get asked if you're dealing with these sorts of patients as well. Um, so I get asked lots of different questions, um, but some of them do tend to repeat um, across the appointments. So um, we'll start by sort of answering the general question that I often get asked, which would be what the actual genetic test is and what it involves and what the results might be that people will get back from it. Um, and then thinking about the actual implications of particular results for the patient in terms of their treatment and also their family members. And then we can think again about the sort of wider implications in terms of the patient's life. So they might have questions about having children in the future, for example, questions about insurance and the question about whether we might get any surprises from the testing as well. So just to start, um, patients are often quite alarmed that they've been booked in for an appointment to talk about the test and consent for the test and think that it might be something that's really serious and involved or dangerous if they're gonna if they're having to have such a long conversation about it. So they can be quite reassured to hear that it's actually usually just a blood test. So we, the standard would be a blood sample. We can sometimes test saliva samples as well if need be. Um, and if the patient is deceased, so we're testing a deceased relative, um, we can test a tissue sample as well. So it, essentially for the patient, that's what it practically involves, though the conversation we have is more around what the results might actually be from that test. So just to separate it out into the different types of testing. So usually if we have a family with an inherited heart condition, the first type of testing we'll be doing is a diagnostic test. So that will be a test that we're doing in the proband. So someone who has a diagnosis of an inherited or of a heart condition that we suspect is inherited so that we know they have a disease but we're going into it blind, not knowing what the actual genetic cause is. So what we usually do with this type of testing is we do a genetic panel. So usually with each um, inherited heart condition, there are a number of different genes that can cause it. So all of those genes will be included on the panel and we're trying to pinpoint which one of those genes could be responsible for the patient's heart problem. So if we are able to pinpoint the specific gene that has caused the heart problem in the family, that then opens up the possibility of some different types of genetic testing. So going on to the far right, we have predictive testing. So that would be the test that we would do for the proband's relatives. So for example, if we have um, a patient, uh, a man with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we do a diagnostic panel test, and we identify the genetic cause in him, and then his children get referred to me, I could do a predictive test in the children. So as far as we are, we're aware, they don't have a heart problem, but we can test them to see if they've inherited the gene change found in their dad, and that will show us if they need to have checks of their heart in the future. Another type of genetic testing, which is similar to predictive testing, is segregation testing. So say, for example, um, if the, we have that man again, that proband with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and he has a brother who also has the same condition, if we find the gene change in the proband, we would then test his affected brother just to confirm 
that he also carries the same gene change. So we suspect he does because he's got the same condition, but we're kind of just crossing the T's and dotting the I's and saying this is the cause in the family. And it's meaning we can then open up testing to other family members as well. So the issue with genetic testing is it's not always as straightforward as I've just described. So thinking about the diagnostic testing again, so doing a genetic panel test, it's a really big and really comprehensive test because we're usually looking at a lot of different genes and we need to analyze all of the variation, all of the changes that are found within those genes to say, do we have enough evidence to say this is actually the cause of the heart problem in the family? So what I tend to say to patients to kind of simplify it is actually there's three possible results from this testing. So the first would be a positive result. So that means we find the genetic cause. So I've got a little scale along the bottom there. So on the far right is pathogenic, which means disease causing. So it means we found a change in a gene and we have enough evidence to say that that particular gene change is the cause of the heart problem in the family. So we can offer predictive testing to family members. The problem is often we'll do a genetic test and we won't get that positive result. We'll actually get a negative result. So we don't find any gene changes to explain why that person has developed a heart condition. And what I have to say to them is, look, that might be because something else has caused it, or it could still be a genetic condition, but the gene that caused it for you maybe hasn't even been discovered yet. The test isn't completely comprehensive because we're still learning so much. So say if we um, did a genetic test for someone and all the gene changes we found were on the left hand side, so the green and benign, that means that they're all healthy variation. So they're not part of, um, they're not causing the patient's heart problem. They wouldn't even be included on the genetic report. So the report would be classed as negative. So nothing has been found. And then another really common result we'll get back is inconclusive. So we'll be somewhere in the middle in the uncertain area. So we might find a change within one of the genes and we think it could be causing the patient to develop heart problems, but we can't be certain at this point. So we're kind of stuck in the gray zone. And again, we're kind of limited in what we can do with that information. So we wouldn't be able to do predictive testing for that. And we'd need to wait for sort of our knowledge and our research to catch up. So we might be able to in the future classify that variant better. So we might in the future be able to say, actually, this gene change, this variant is pathogenic, or we may in the future be able to say this gene change is benign, but we'd need to maybe discover it in another family or there might need to be um, research into its effect um, at the molecular level in the gene. So it, we often get stuck in the genetic gray zone and that can be really difficult for patients both to understand because it can get really complicated and also because there's not very much we can do with it at this point. So if we were going to do a predictive test in the family, so if we did have a known pathogenic or likely pathogenic gene change in the family, that's actually quite straightforward. So it usually takes less than a month to get the results back. We're just looking to see if the patient has inherited the specific gene change. And there are two possible results from that. So um, thinking again, if if this was the two copies of the gene and one of the genes was not working properly, for the, um, for the patient's children, we would be seeing if they've inherited the not working copy of the gene or the working copy. And then the second circle I've added on there is from their other parent. So the children who are having the predictive test, for example, will get a positive result saying you've inherited the gene change, the faulty copy of the gene, and you need to keep having heart scans. Or they might get a negative result saying, actually, you haven't inherited this, you don't need to be checked. Often patients will say, actually, does this change anything for me? If you come back and say this is the gene that's caused your heart problem, does that will they have a special drug that can treat this? Um, usually the answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, it just means we'll say why you have the condition. Um, but I do always counsel that there is a small possibility that treatment can be changed in specific circumstances. So I'll give you an example now. Um, if a patient comes in with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we do a diagnostic um, genetic test, we may find that they have a gene change in a gene called GLA. 
And um, that's a gene that's involved in building an enzyme in our body, which has got a, such a mouthful of a name, alpha-galactosidase A. And essentially, if you lack this enzyme, you have a condition called Fabry's disease. So it can cause a number of different problems in the body, but one of the features is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So patients would be treated with enzyme replacement therapy for that. So it's very different to the treatment you'd get if you had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a different genetic cause. So it can change things. Um, another example would be a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy who has a diagnostic genetic test and we find a pathogenic gene change in this gene LMNA or LAMIN. Um, we know that this particular gene is really high risk, um, so it's associated with a high risk of sudden death. And someone who has a change within this gene, we would strongly consider an ICD for them. So it can help with risk stratification in patients as well. Again, one of the really important questions is, is this going to help my family? What will it mean for them? So we have a patient here. If we find the genetic cause in them, we can now do cascade testing in their relatives. So we can start narrowing down who needs to be checked in the family. So we know they've got some half siblings there on their mum's side, but we don't know if they need to be checked until we test the patient's mum. We test the patient's mum and she's positive. So then we can start cascading the testing down to his half siblings and show that some of them need to be checked whilst others don't. And we can even move to wider family members now. So we're looking at the patient's aunt who's negative. So then we know those four cousins who are the four sons of the aunt don't need to be checked. And we can also check uh, a, a cousin over here whose mum had already passed away from a heart problem, which is suspicious that they may have had the heart problem that we found in the proband. And actually this cousin then went underwent screening and was found to have the same heart problem. So it can narrow down in the family who needs to be checked. It can be really useful. Just briefly, patients often, if they come to me and they're at a young age, might be thinking of having children in the future. And um, it's obviously important to, if the patient has a heart condition, especially in women, that they have um, input from their doctor to say if it's safe for them to carry a pregnancy. But if they've been given the green light for that, they might be concerned about passing a genetic heart condition on to their children. So we can talk through some of the options that are available for them. Many patients do just conceive naturally and their children will be having heart screening after that. But others might consider um, having testing during pregnancy, a form of IVF where they can screen the embryos and other options as well. Um, things like using donor sperm, donor eggs, surrogacy um, or adoption and fostering as well. So that's something we can explore in the appointment. And a really big question. Lots of patients will have concerns about genetic testing and insurance. So I'm always quite happy to reassure patients that actually this usually won't have an impact on insurance for them. So if a patient is having a predictive genetic test, there's actually an agreement in place with the Association of British Insurers and the government saying that insurers in the UK do not have they don't need to um, find out about this information and patients don't have to disclose it to them. So if you don't have a heart condition, but you've had a test showing you carry um, the gene change that causes the heart condition, so you need regular checks, you don't need to disclose that to an insurer. However, if you do have a diagnosis of a heart condition, so you've had a diagnostic genetic test, that information isn't necessarily protected from insurers. Um, so they could potentially ask about it. But what I would usually say is if you've already got a diagnosis of a heart condition, that's the main thing the insurers are going to be thinking about when they're doing the costings for your insurance. And although they could potentially factor in your genetic results, it shouldn't have too much of an impact because you've already got the diagnosis itself. And uh, another really um, important question to address is people want to know, are we going to come back with something surprising? So what I would usually say to patients is no, because we're not going looking for it. So the tests that we do are, are tailored to the condition they have. So we're looking at genes that are involved in their own diagnosis. Um, but genes can have other effects in the body. 
And so there is a small possibility that we may come back with a surprising result. So it, it, it is possible, but unlikely. I'll give you another example. Um, so I had a patient who had dilated cardiomyopathy and they had a diagnostic genetic test. And um, we found they had a change within a gene called SDHA. And I've written heterozygous form, which means we all have two copies of this gene and they had a change in one of their copies. So if someone has change in two copies of this gene, this sometimes can cause cardiomyopathy. But if you have a change in one copy, it causes a whole nother condition, which again has got a mouthful of a name, hereditary paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma. So it's growths of tumours um, in, the, in the nervous system, essentially. Um, and so I had to tell the patient, we haven't found a cause for your heart problem, but we have found that you may be at risk of developing these growths. And you probably need to be under a specialist clinic and you need to have some scans. And the patient had a scan and a lump was found in her neck and that needed to be surgically removed. So that was a very surprising result and it was a new one for me as well. But it just shows that things can be found that we weren't exactly looking for. So that's all I was going to cover today. Um, and if anyone has any questions for me, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ellie. Always from you, a very clear talk with lots of really uh, useful, practical information. So um, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. We do have a question in the comment box and uh, it goes it's from uh, Bethany Souter asking, in segregation testing, would you only test for the known gene change in the family or would you do a broader panel looking for that and other uh, variants? Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. So um, we would initially, so say, say for example, we've got yeah, two brothers with HCM. That, that's the example I gave before. So if we tested the first brother with a panel and we found a clear pathogenic variant, we would just test his brother for that. Um, the reason is, number one, it's cheaper and it's quicker. Because if we did a panel in the second brother, we, it, it would take six months to get the results and it would be about 10 times the cost probably. Um, so practically, we would just use what we already have. Um, however, surprises do happen in genetics. So there is a possibility that we find a pathogenic variant in the in the proband. We test his brother and he doesn't have it. So if that's the case, then we would open it up to a panel because mm. the suspicion would be that there would be two genes in the family that are causing mm. the conditions. And uh, cardiac genetics never fails to throw up. <laughs> these complicated situations where it's, you're, you're sure you're going to find this result and then a whole other thing is found. So it does happen. But in general, if we found um, something in a family, we would generally just test for that because yeah. that's what we expect to find. Yes, that's very clear. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, one more question. Um, you had a fantastic slide with um, the range of results that one might <clears throat> get on a genetic report. Uh, including pathogenic, likely pathogenic and variants of, of unknown significance. Uh, as we learn more about uh, these different variants and the roles that they might play in causing disease, sometimes there's reclassifications of these variants. So what's the approach that we take there when we uh, have to look back at our previous genetic testing of patients, taking into account the information that we now know? Yes, yeah, so this is a big issue in genetics because we don't have a process for systematically reviewing all of the variants that have been <clears> found <throat> in the past. Mm. Luckily, because we have patients under continuous care in inherited cardiac conditions, that is a really good thing because doctors are offering trig often triggering us to review mm. the results we had from the past. So we might have a patient who was at the time found to have a variant of unknown significance. The doctor sees them five years later and asks us to re-review the variant and we'll speak mm. to our lab colleagues and we might be able to reclassify it. Mm. Um, but that can be really challenging um, when we've told families one thing and now we're giving them a whole different answer. And it can be that's why counselling can be really important for patients mm. to explain why things have changed and what the steps are going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. That was fantastic. Um, 